All right. Tough act to follow. <laughs> Not feeling good right now. That was amazing, Ruben. Just what an inspiration to so many, so many people, not just in this room, but outside of this room as well. How's everyone doing? Come on, how's everyone doing? That's more like it. All right. So uh, it's just wonderful to be here at the, uh, at the Open Source Summit. Um, so many friends, so many, so many members of the Open Source family, and so many new faces as well. I'm particularly excited, as, as Jim mentioned, that we're going to be uh, this week running the Open Community button, the Open Community Conference, which is, which is a, a conference that I've been working in, in conjunction with my friends at the, at the Linux Foundation around, which is designed to provide best practice and guidance for how we can build powerful and engaging communities. Uh, we did this last month at the Open Source Summit in LA, and it was a great success. So I'm really proud to bring it here, and I want to say a big thank you to all of you who submitted papers and also to those of you who submitted papers that, that didn't get in. We had a huge number of submissions. Um, so I work as a community strategy consultant, and I work with a bunch of companies across all kinds of different sectors around how to build communities either externally around a product or a service, or, co or communities inside of a company that are designed to optimize how we work together and reduce silos. One of the questions that I get repeatedly is, how do I motivate people into action? Like, how do I get people to do the things that I want them to do? And this is not really a question that just pertains specifically to communities. This also applies to how we build businesses and how we encourage our uh, employees to, to kind of work together and, and work efficiently as well, as well as to our, you know, as well as in our families as well. This is my son, Jack, who is not hacking cars right now. Um, but how do we encourage our kids and our nieces and nephews and everybody else to kind of work together in interesting and effective ways? So today I want to talk about incentives the psychology behind why we do things and how we're incentivized, and then a framework that you can think about how to apply this. Now, it all starts, like many things, with one of these, a brain. Uh, most of us have got one of these in our heads. Um, and the brain is basically divided into two approximate areas. One side is the conscious, intentional thought, right? So we interpret the world around us, and we make decisions based upon th that stimulus. But the other part of the brain is completely subconscious. Uh, it's almost on autopilot, and it influences so many of our behaviors. What's interesting is that we are irrational with this side of the brain. We make irrational choices, but we're very consistent in those irrationalities and, and how we make those decisions. So that gives us a bit of a framework, a scaffold in, in which we can think about how we design communities and how people fit together. And I want to share four key principles here, four elements that really kind of go into why we make the decisions that we do and how we can harness those for how we, how we build incentives. The first one is that fundamentally, we all strive for acceptance in some kind of capacity. So when you build a community, this is the, uh, one of the Ubuntu developer summits that we ran in Florida. When you join a community or when you join a company or when you're part of your family, you want to be accepted, but ultimately you want to get to a stage where you feel a sense of belonging. Because when you feel a sense of belonging, when, you, when you're part of something, you stick around there for a long period of time. And what this tells me is that because we strive for that acceptance, when we design that set of incentives. It has to be a consistently connected set of incentives that keep people around for a longer period of time. And then ultimately, what you get, the, the byproduct of that, is that sense of acceptance, that sense of belonging. The other thing that's interesting here is that status plays a critical role here. As humans, status, much as many of us will want to deny this, is important to us. It's one of the reasons why airline mileage programs work. It's one of the reasons why people care about their job titles and moving up in their careers is that we want to be recognized for the things that we contribute. The critical thing here is that while building status into communities and companies is fine, it has to be built on a platform of equality. We don't reward people because of their skin color, or because of their sexuality, or because of their gender, or any other differentiator. We don't reward or deny people. What we do is we build an environment where everybody can succeed and accomplish that status equally. So the second piece here is that we're a fundamentally reciprocal species. Like, if, if, if I do something for you, you're going to feel like you, you need to do something back for me as well. A good example of this is gifting. So, for example, if I, if I uh, gave Ruben a present, he would feel a natural kind of inclination to kind of repay the favor in some kind of way. And if, while Ruben's on his world travels and speaking at conferences, he met a company and he referred them to me and said, hey, you know, you should talk to this guy. He can help you build a community. I'd feel a reciprocal inclination to kind of repay the favor back to Ruben as well. So 
Reciprocation is at the heart of how we build incentives as well, is that you design something where if you do this, then this will happen. And that's another powerful force that we need to harness. The third is that we form habits. And the way in which we form those habits is with, is with repetition. So in 2008, I moved to California. And spoiler alert, I didn't really care that much about health or exercise or eating well, right? I was a pretty unfortunate human being in the sense that I was lazy in terms of eating, in terms of exercise. My wife, who many of you in this room know, is the opposite of that. Like, she eats kale like I've never seen anybody eat kale in, in, large, in large quantities. So she got me into this habit of, well, maybe you should go out and exercise a little bit more. So I started exercising, started going running, swimming, cycling. And then as I did that, I started doing it more. And I had to think about it. I had to really intentionally go out and exercise. And then I did a little bit more. And before you knew it, exercise was just something that, you know, I thought of, well, when am I going to exercise today? You know, it just became part of the habit. And it's because we do it over and over again, so then you don't have to think about it, it becomes habitual. The general thinking here is that it takes around 66 days to develop a habit. So what that teaches us as well is, if somebody joins our community or joins our company, th that first 66 days is critical. We have to design an incentive path that keeps people motivated in moving forward until participation and collaboration is part of the norm. This is something I experience a lot with my clients, particularly for companies who are kind of working in a slightly older fashion, they want to kind of bring open source into their companies, is getting into the habit of things like peer, uh, uh, peer review around code uh, and, and, and collaboration, participating in open communication channels. The fourth is that most of us, I'm going to censor as we've got some children in the room, most of us have a bit of a BS radar, okay? Is that when we look at the world, we, we, want, we want to be treated in authentic ways. This is one of the reasons why you should never thank anybody with a computer. When you get one of those automated emails thanking you for something, it, it, we just discount it. It doesn't really mean anything. But if you get a, if you get a thank you from a, from a human being, from an individual, it means a lot. So as we do this, we have to design these incentives in a way that is authentic, that is personal, that is human, because that's what's going to keep us moving forward. We can't compromise that. The minute we compromise this, the whole thing falls apart. So these four principles, and this is just four, there are many of these principles in how we, in how we design communities, again, act as that framework, but it also acts as a, as, a, as a lens in which we can look at how we build these kinds of communities as well. Now the question is, OK, so we've got this sense of, of what we should focus on. Like, how do we do it? Like, how do we actually incentivize people? How do we design these things that get people participating? To me, the way in which we do this is the first thing we need to do is to understand kind of the, the anatomy of an incentive, OK? So what goes behind it? And I think of an incentive as having three core components. The hook, the reason, and the reward, OK? So as I go through this, think about this within the context, not just of if you're running a community, but also, again, your organizations, your local communities in your, in your local area, whatever it might be, or even how you apply this to your kids. The hook is, is, um, is essentially what, is, what triggers the incentive. And this is all about measuring effectively how people participate in different ways, okay? So the way I tend to think of incentives is that people participate in a, in a community or in a company, and then based upon what they do, it triggers a series of different incentives. And so if you continue working, if you continue doing good and interesting work, essentially you get new incentives that keep you moving forward. It's kind of like a video game, that as you go through a video game, more and more and newer challenges are presented to you, and it keeps your interest, it captures your interest until you build that habit. Now, for us to do this well, we have to measure a contribution. We have to understand what a contribution is and how we track that. Now, most people, when they do this, they tend to track the action, the thing that you did, okay? So I said earlier on that what we want to build here is significant and sustained contributions, OK? And when you track actions, you track the sustained contributions, people doing things for a, long, for, uh, for a longer period of time. The problem with this is that while you can track people posting to a forum or submitting pull requests or translating strings or you know, running events or speaking at events, you may get people who do a lot of that work, but it's not very good. So what we should also track is the validation of the action. As an example, when you submit a pull request, that's an action, but if that pull request gets, it gets code reviewed and merged into the master branch, then that's a validated action, is that we know that it was good, and therefore we can count on that as being a good contribution to the community. It's critical that we track both of these things, and a significant number of the metrics kind of tracking platforms only track the first one. 
And we have to focus on the second one as well. As an example, one of my uh, previous clients is a company called HackerOne. I was actually just chatting to Ruben's family about this. Um, and what's interesting about this is there's a public point system that they use here. And they track reputation and signal. So reputation, essentially HackerOne is a platform where you can submit vulnerability reports around popular products and services. So um, you know, someone might hack Starbucks, and they submit a report. If that report is valid, they get seven points. If it's complete garbage, then they get minus seven points, and there's a graduation between the two. So the reputation tracks the total number of points, but the signal tracks the average number of points for a typical report. So it gives us a real good uh, a differentiator between high contribution and the quality of that contribution. And there's loads of ways in which we can do this. Code contribution review, event organization, translations, governance. These are the kind of things that we should be thinking about. Now let's talk about the reason. So the reason is essentially, why would someone do something? What are we asking them to do? And we need to pick things that influence and encourage positive behavioral patterns and contributions. We want to design incentives that trigger the right kind of behavior. And I tend to think of two ways of presenting these. I call them submarine and stated uh, incentives. Now, a submarine incentive is basically a random act of goodwill that's completely programmed. Okay? So as an example, if you're tracking some of the work that somebody's doing, and you want to incentivize them in some way, one thing you could do as a simple thing is send them a t-shirt. Now, I would do that when they've participated seven to 10 times. They've been around long enough where they're doing some interesting work, but they're on that verge of like, do I continue? Okay, it's kind of like getting two weeks into a new diet. At that point, you're really thinking about the, the cheeseburger at that point. So submarine incentives, if we design all of the, if we design a bunch of these submarine incentives, we pre-program them in, but they come from humans. So we notify a human of this particular incentive. What we get then is that kind of roadmap, and it builds that habit. Now, stated incentives are a little different. These are very much stated, if you do this thing, then we will do this thing for you. A good example of this is if you go to a coffee shop and they give you a little card and you stamp you know, a little coffee cup each time you buy a coffee, and then when you get to 10, you get a free coffee. There's no ambiguity around that. If you, get ten, if you buy 10 coffees, you get a free one, okay? And that's good. We also see things around you know, campaigns and competitions. If you do this thing, then you could win this prize. Both are important. And, and both are different ways in which, we can, in which we can deliver this. Now, some of you may be thinking, OK, well, that's good, but how do I choose the incentives that I want to focus on? It's difficult for me to provide some general guidance here, because it has to be specific to your community or to your organization for it to be authentic. Like I said, people have got a BS radar, so we need to pick things that are very much attuned to that particular area, not just throwing out swag at people. However, the way I tend to think of this is as you're choosing them, Think about the value that you want to bring in that incentive, not just from the community or from the organization's perspective, but also from the individual. If you can pick an incentive where the individual feels a sense of personal growth and, and, and benefit, but then the, or, the organization also feels a, a sense of personal growth and benefit, then you've got a good incentive on your hands. And then the final thing here is the reward, like how to reward someone. So we've measured something. It's triggered an incentive. What they've done is they've done that the goal of that incentive successfully, now we need to reward them in some way. There's two types of rewards in the world, intrinsic and extrinsic. And we tend to think mostly in a lot of the communities that I work with around the extrinsic, swag, physical things, physical items that you can send people. Obviously, this is expensive. You have a limited set of funds that you can spend on this kind of stuff. Shipping, anyone who's run a crowdfunding campaign will know that shipping is an absolute freaking nightmare, okay? So shipping is, a, is, is difficult. So that locks off certain regions of the world because it's very difficult to ship to them. So there's benefits to this. But to me, the real value here are the intrinsic rewards. This is essentially rewarding someone with your approval, with your validation. And it gets to that acceptance pattern that I mentioned earlier on. Just a single thank you email from the CEO of a company or the founder of a project, a highlighting someone in a blog post or social media, sending them an invitation to something, an executive, like inviting people to an executive call with the executive team. Having a direct, like one of the things I like to do with some of my clients is when you reach a, a particular status level is you get an email address that goes directly to the executives of the company. And those executives will respond within 24 hours immediately. You get that highlight, you get the bat phone. Testimonials, referrals, these are all different ways in which we can, we can build that sense of, sense of uh, validation. So in conclusion, when thinking about how we incentivize people, Focus on acceptance, reciprocation, habit forming, and building authentic, may, may, most importantly, be authentic. 
measure effectively, incentivize based on shared value, and reward effectively. Um, and I'm going to be speaking in a little bit more detail. This is kind of interesting to you. I'm going to be speaking in Carlin to 11.15 today to, to go into a bit more depth about this. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>